it came from a session of rolfing that I had in probably 72. Um, I was a four-step delivery baby. And my skull had these ripples on it. You could, in fact, I've still got a few. Um, but the ripples are from the compression of the forceps. And if you make the skull smaller with forceps or compression like that, you end up with these little ripples. It looks like there's been a flood, and in the sand you get those ripples. It's like that. They're kind of like that. They go up and down and like that. And Dr. Rolf felt my skull and went, somebody take an elbow to her skull. <laughs> oh, dear God. So somebody sat there and went, <laughs> on my skull, all over. It's probably, it remains today, the most ridiculously painful session I ever had. It was just awful. But uh, it, the changes were pretty, pretty good, pretty huge. And I went, I went away from that session thinking, gee, that's a wonderful change. But if I did that to my clients, they'd never come back. <laughs> you know? It was just like, whoa, that's bad. So I thought to myself, maybe there's a way to do it without all the misery. Wouldn't that be nice if I could find a way to get some change without sending people through the roof? So I thought to myself, well, what can I do on all these irregularities and lumps and bumps and ripply stuff? What can I do with this kind of stuff that would work? And to me, <coughs> it was the most obvious thing, was to use the backs of my hands as opposed to the front. Backs of my hands, get on the skull and twist. And the twisting was kind of like trying to follow some of these ridges down, you know, kind of like if you spin, you get more change in the tissue than if you just go straight. Because it opens it and spreads it and, and makes it go out this way as opposed to just sliding through, which kind of cuts a plane through. So the, uh, the spinning motion was something that I picked up that I thought I would try, and then I used two hands to do it, and it seemed to do very well. And I thought at first I was just simply smoothing out the surface of the skull, making it so that it was a little smoother just on the surface, because how many times do you walk into a door or you know hurt, hurt your head and you've got a big bruise and a lump up there that hurts for a while, and that causes adhesions. All the swelling that goes on in the body creates a glue that causes adhesions. So from breaks or cuts or you know, contusions and bruises, all those kinds of things leave behind a puddle. The extent that the puddle spreads is the extent of the glue. And you got to figure that the whole skull is kind of a mass of adhesion all over the place. So I was thinking I would loosen the scalp and the connective tissue of the skull. And if you look at the skull, there's almost no muscle behind the hairline. And how many people can wiggle their ears? How many people can do much? Mostly you can do your forehead, but there's almost no people that can actually move the top of their skull or the back of their skull, certainly not voluntarily. There's usually no muscle back there, no voluntary muscle. So I'm thinking, gee, you know, the reason I'm getting this is there's all this wealth of connective tissue on the surface, and I'm just working with that. Well, the first person that came along that sort of disabused me of that notion after, oh, 20 years of working like this, was a lady that came in and uh, she got huge amounts of change in her skull. And I was teasing her. I said, oh, now your hats won't fit. And she came back and said, you're right, my hats don't fit. I said, you're kidding. Your hats don't fit, really? She says, yes. And she brought in this one. She said, look at the one I'm wearing. And she pulled it out and it had inside of it one of those baseball cap closures, right? She said, you can see that the closure had expanded this much, like over two inches of diameter expansion in that woman's skull from the hat size, what she was wearing. And she says, I have to throw half my hats away. You know, they won't fit anymore. Only the ones with expansion or the soft ones will still fit. And I thought to myself, really? That's a heck of a lot of expansion. And yes, she did have a lot of trauma in her skull and everything. Very important to get that out. But I was stunned that it was so much. So shortly after that, which would be somewhere around 95, I went to Israel and taught a skull class on a cranium like this one. And I mentioned this lady and the fact that we'd gotten all that measurable change. And they said, let's measure. I went, all right, let's measure it. So we did a very rough in the back room. They measured everybody in the class, somewhere around 30 people all together, and uh, measured them in the back room for hat size circumference around this way. 
just one measurement, measured everybody before and after. And it appeared that everyone got a minimum of a half an inch change, the most we got was an inch and a half on one leg of uh, circumference diameter change. And I thought to myself, wow, that's an awful lot of change uh, consistently throughout this whole thing. And I thought, this is really interesting. So I decided at that point, when the first Yossi conference came up, I decided to demo this, because I wanted my fellow rovers to know that this was a possibility. And I did demos, and one demo we got three quarters of an inch, and the other one an inch and a quarter, or something like that, over an inch worth of change on the skull. And somebody else measured them, I didn't measure them um, before and after. So I'm thinking that we get volumetric change in the skull, which is interesting also, because you'd think that you just simply move it around a little bit, that you wouldn't get an actual expansion of volume, but it looks like we get volume, volume as well as all the rest of the contour change and the smoothing out of any dents or dings or anything like that. Sharon, did you say that um, you've seen craniums shrink too, if, they, if that's yeah, what they need? one of the guys, when I said a half inch minimum change, one of the guys got a half inch smaller. And I thought about it and I said, no, what happened? Did we screw up? <laughs> no. Did we make a mess of this poor man because everybody else got larger? Well, no, because he was a drowning episode, an inhale hold drowning episode, where he had been a little child, had fallen into the pool, taken that last breath, and dropped to the bottom of the pool, and was waiting for somebody to notice, and held and held and held and held and held, and held his breath until he couldn't hold it anymore. Finally, he breathed in the water and figured he was a gonger, and then somebody saw him, hauled him out, and got him pumped out of water and conscious again. Uh, I don't think he had brain damage, but his entire body, when you rocked him, got smaller. Because usually you get an expansion in the ribcage, his ribcage got smaller. Okay? So he was a great big guy like this, and he sort of diminished a bit, and his skull was really round, and his cheeks were really... You know, everything was like his throat was like pushed forward, his chin was rounded like that, stuck in this kind of kind of pattern. You know? Dr. Rolf used to say that if you go up to and scrape the tissue off the bone, but for her, I think that the bone was kind of like up to where you went to and you didn't go beyond it. Um, what I have done is go through the bone. You can work in the brain, and I do all the time. I work in the brain, I reposition the brain, I change things. Um, you can do all parts of the skull. So if you do the, the torquing on the cranium, for some reason, the, the double torque, the two hands are important. You can't do it with one, it doesn't work. You've got to have two. And I'll show you how to do all that and how the, what we're really doing is going through the entire skull. You're working through the skull in the center of the brain when you're doing this. So you should know that that's what you're doing. It all changes, the whole thing changes, the whole volume. It's like you can reach all the way through, which is very cool, very cool indeed. Uh, and very beneficial for people who have had brain damage. So it has to be between the two hands. It's kind of like, um, I like to tell people, and really this is a question of, of focus and practice to some extent. But as I say, when I started, I was just sort of just working the outside, I thought. Sometimes, sometimes I'm more bracing with my yeah. left hand than I am, but most of the time I've got them both working. I'm playing between the two hands. I will feel some place in the skull that feels like it needs to have work. It's short, it's less resilient, there's less give in that area, and that's the area I'll pick, and then I'll find the other side of it. I'll go looking around and feel that when the two hands are connected, that's where I work, and then I'll take and put my torque through. And the first little bit of pushing in, and the first little part of the twist is taking up the slack, and then I've got a very solid connection, and then I just take it and put my two hands. Right. And what you were saying to me one time is that there's a vector of energy that's actually like a and then you call that, yeah, down yeah. in the middle to the I was, I was kidding in one of the classes. I'd, I have a girlfriend who's a Betty Boop fan, right? You know? And I was looking around for Betty Boop things to give her for her birthday, right? You know, And I found this little piece of glass that had etched into the middle of it this really cute little Betty Boop figure, right? And I said to myself, how the heck do they do that, <laughs> right? How 
way they make it so they don't have to cut through the glass to create this beautiful little model. And I'm sure you've seen these pieces of glass. They have ships, they have Harley Davidsons in them, they have pictures of Elvis, you know, where <laughs> they got stuff etched in there, right? So this was a little Betty Boop, and I'm looking at it going, I don't see how they got in there, right? So I went online and I typed into Google, how do you make these, you know, images in glass, right? They take two lasers and the lasers meet and that's where the cutting happens, okay? So it's two vectors of energy that come together and then they can use those two and they change their, you know, the lasers come all the way around this like this to cut, right? Mm -hmm. So at any angle they're coming this way and they're cutting into the glass in the center and it's where they meet that they get the etching. So they can go straight through the glass without cutting through, right? And just carve out the very center, cause a, cause a pattern to appear in the middle. So it's kind of how I think of this. You've got two hands, you're creating a force vector that goes into the skull, and where they meet is where you're really working, from the center. And this is something that I picked up from Dr. Rolf in terms of like force vectors right in the very beginning of my Rolfing. And that's what you do in the cranium. You work between the two hands. So if you're not actively working with one hand as much as you are the other, you're at least bracing it so that you can work with the other one. Usually what I will do on people is I will start by checking everything to see where there are particular problems. If you feel around the eye sockets, you'll usually see that one is distorted. You know, people bang themselves, you know, they hit. Uh, all kinds of stuff happens with the face. So what I do is it's sort of a light once over to check and make sure, sort of starting to ease things up and starting to loosen the worst of it up in the face and stuff like that. That's usually what I do. I'll feel on the cranium. Then I will, when I've done that sort of a once over kind of thing and easing things, then I'll turn the person on their side and start looking at the neck because it's easier to get the neck from the side than it is from the back because you can't see what you're doing. If you turn them on the side, you've got all kinds of access to the front and the back, and you've got the whole half of the cranium that you can do. And I don't really do torque across the front of the cranium very much, unless there's been a lot of blows and damage and you know stuff like that up there. I usually use uh, I'll go from the eyebrow up, but you know I don't do tons of torque across the frontal bone. Usually it's back in the back, it's back in the back, and at the occiput is the occiput is probably one of the nicest places to get torque in is the place where very often when you have whiplash, the whole skull will turn under. And it will turn under and slide on the neck so that it's jammed under like that. That's a pattern you really feel a whole lot. So you're looking a lot at the occiput. I'm, a lot of times I'm feeding out of the occiput. And often if you think of the birth process, that's what gets jammed and when you come out as a baby. So some of us have never, since the time we started the birth process, had the occiput freed up enough to actually line up on top of the skull. I often feed from the occiput up. That's usually where the, where the shift is, is they're usually tucked under and back. And sometimes you get so much shift in the occiput on the spine that you actually kink the spinal cord through there. So imagine getting that out. That's a huge relief for people. Once I get the outside of the skull done, then I do the face. Okay? So that's my pattern of it. So Dr. Rolf would only lay people on their back, do a little bit of preparatory work around the clavicles and down in here, and then she'd start with the jaw. She'd start working in the mouth. So she'd do interior work and uh, do the mouth um, and the nose, and then sort of integrate a little bit. That was it. So for me, I turn them on the side, I do the whole cranium on one side, turn them on the side, do the whole cranium on the other, and then balance it. And then I go inside. So it all fits together better. And I feel if you take the pressure off the skull and allow it to expand it, it gives the, the face some place to go. All the bones of the face some place to go. And this is a way to get enormous amounts of change that nobody's ever realized that you can get in the cranium. 